Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology, activists uh, for here for Elite Forward in Medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. There's a lot of community happening tonight. I want to say welcome uh, to all of the communities that are watching at home. This ecosystem that has been set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network that we are looking to develop, and it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Hi there and welcome to London for the Functional Forum UK. We're here at the AFMCP event and I'm your host, Dr. Rongan Chasti. Now your usual host, James Maskell, is not here today, he's taking a little bit of time off as he's just completed a 145 day bus tour across the United States. So James, I hope you're doing well, but we're here in London, we've got AFMCP going on. This is the largest AFMCP event that we've ever had in the UK. Now I did this course for myself about six years ago in America and it changed the course my entire career. We're going to be bringing you the highlights from the course here in London. I've got to tell you, it's really exciting being here because we've got over 300 attendees. We've got over 50% of these guys are doctors. I've never seen so much energy here in the UK for functional medicine. We've got cardiologists, we've got anaesthetists, we've got GPs, we've got psychiatrists. It's a fantastic course and over the next hour I'm going to be talking to some of the speakers, Dr. Bob Rowntree from Colorado, Dr. Shilpa Saxena from Florida, and the UK's very own Michael Ash. But I'm also going to be talking to some of the attendees, you know, who are going to give you some of their clinical pearls. So without further ado, let's get on to the content of today's show. We've got one of the most engaging speakers, Dr. Bob Roundtree, medical doctor from Colorado, who's going to be talking about immune dysfunction and inflammation. Why do we have persistent inflammation? It's either because the person has an ongoing injury, which could mean a person that's sensitive to gluten continues to eat the gluten, or the person who's got tendonitis in their wrist is continuing to type away at their computer all day and get a repetitive motion, or perhaps they've got some kind of infection in their intestines, a yeast overgrowth. So if you've got ongoing exposure to the injury or if the immune system does not turn off, it fails at counter-regulation. Most chronic diseases are linked to excessive or persistent inflammation. Any disease you can name, you can find an inflammatory component to it. So the idea is that if you can do something about the inflammation, then you don't have to worry so much about whether you've come up with the perfect drug to treat that disease. Instead, you found a way to dampen the process. So how can we avoid inflammation? Or how can we dampen inflammation? We look for the lifestyle factors that trigger it. And we, we use things like omega-3 fatty acids from, from deep sea fish to help dampen the inflammatory mediators. So we can use diet, lifestyle, and in some cases, nutritional supplements, dietary supplements, to help dampen the overall scenario. That's working upstream. You do that in combination with going downstream. So this is you next week. You're back in surgery. Everything is up in flames. What do I do? Well, doctors have been asking this question for millennia. In fact, the inflammatory process is one of the, the oldest known medical phenomenon. When you look back through ancient writings of physicians, you find references to the inflammatory process that go back thousands of years. So physicians uh, of, of ancient times have been looking at this process and saying, okay, there's four basic concepts here. There's swelling, two more. There's redness, rubor. There's heat, calor and there's pain, dolor. And the inflammatory process involves these particular manifestations no matter where, where it is. If you, uh, if you cut yourself, you'll get redness, swelling, heat, and pain. If you have an allergy to bee pollen, then you get redness, swelling, heat, and pain. If you have cardiovascular disease, well, the pain might not be so obvious until the person has angina. It's still part of the process. 
So it's the same underlying process no matter how it manifests. And then later, Galen added functio lesse, loss of function to that, which I think is a pretty important addition. So this is what you might see in clinic. Heat, redness, redness, swelling, pain, loss of function. Now, there is one question, which is the most important question to ask yourself if you see this. Do you need to do something? Right? Is this progressive? Is this going to get worse? Is it infected? Is this wound going to separate? Am I going to have to open that up? Am I going to have to treat with antibiotics? Or is what I'm looking at a natural part of the healing process? This is a really key question to ask, is it not? Because if you err on the side of being aggressive, if you say, oh my God, I think this is going to get worse. If you decide this is going to get worse and you give the person antibiotics, you could create other problems. You can create dysbiosis in their intestines and they can develop Clostridium difficile colitis and now they end up with a life-threatening problem. So you may have, quote, solved one problem and created another. So the response that you have to the question, what's going to happen next? What is the trend? That's what I want to know. With all inflammatory cases, rheumatoid arthritis, what is the trend? Does this look like it's getting worse or does it look like it's getting better? That's a different question than how do I cure this? How do I fix this? I'm just asking the question, how do I make sure it's going in the right direction so the body can heal itself? Because the body does the healing. I don't do the healing. What does the immune system do? It has two primary functions. It defends against invasion and it uses two basic processes for doing that. It spews chemical, invader, uh, chemical uh, toxins onto the invaders, bleach. It bleaches the invaders, or it eats them. Or if there's damaged tissue, the immune system will wall off the area of the damage and activate a healing response. We'll tell fibroblasts to come into the area and start filling in the gaps. We'll start forming fibrin clots. Now, this is a long list. I want you to, to ask, what is it that, that ties all these things together as inflammatory triggers? Trauma, cellular debris, pathogenic microbes, toxins, immunogens like the bee pollen, free radicals, advanced glycation end products. These all have certain molecular structures that interact with receptors on a molecular level that turn on these physiologic cascades that activate an inflammatory response. So let me pick an example. Number two, cellular debris. We now know when certain immune cells come under attack, neutrophils will actually self-destruct and they will form what's called neutrophilic extracellular traps, NETs. Basically, they just throw out their insides into the surrounding area. And you know what that creates? A toxic soup of DNA and mitochondria, all kinds of structures that aren't supposed to be in circulation. So when our, the rest of the immune system sees all that stuff, sees that cellular debris, it says, this is bad. It gets activated, and it turns on. Everything becomes activated. So again, no matter what the trigger is, it's all working through the same mechanism. Do you understand what I'm saying here? It's always going to be something that activates some kind of receptor and turns on a physiologic cascade. And if we know that that's going on, then we can first ask the question, what's the trigger? Where's the trauma? Is there an infection? Is it a food that the person is eating? Are there free radicals being generated for some reason? And what can I do about that? Because you can do a lot about all of these triggers. Now, this is a, some of the latest research I wanted to show you. Apparently, there's been this organism discovered called Candida albicans. Anybody heard of this mysterious Candida albicans? You probably have some in your body right now in various cavities just ready for you to have a little bit of ice cream. It has a great time breaking down that sugar and then it proliferates. And then it can release little hyphae that penetrate the mucosa 
and creates cracks in the mucosa and breaks down the barrier and can allow other pathogens to come in. So we want to do something about that. We want to be able to respond to that candida albicans. And here we have an innate immune cell, a macrophage, that is engulfing the candida. How does the macrophage know to eat the candida? It's because there are molecular structures on the surface of the candida, and there are receptors that correspond to those molecular structures. These are core structures uh, in, in uh, the biology, in immunobiology, they call these structures motifs. A motif is a repeating pattern, you know, ba 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 bum, ba 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 bum, right? That is like a little musical motif from Beethoven. But, well, I know, I'm not a musician, so that's why I'm lecturing you today, because I couldn't make it in an orchestra. But it's a motif, ba 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 bum, and the immune cell hears that, sees that motif, and that activates it. So it wakes up and it engulfs the candida albicans. Normally, immune cells are sleeping in our body. They're in a dormant mode because it takes a lot of energy to do this engulfing, right? So they rather conserve their energy. They're in the sleeping mode, but then something activates them, some molecular structure and usually that molecular structure is in combination with a, a, an inflammatory signal like a cytokine. So the cytokine is a little pen, a wake-up call. Wake up, wake up, wake up. And then it, see, quote, sees the molecular structure. It gets activated, starts moving along through the capillaries to the site of where the injury was. At the same time, chemicals get released in the the local bloodstream that cause clotting. That's sequestration. How can you use that, inflammation, that information? Well, I had a patient who kept getting recurrent deep vein thromboses. We said, oh, maybe it's because you take long airplane trips. No, it turned out it was because he had prostate cancer. So he had the prostate cancer, and the inflammation from the prostate cancer was causing him to be hyper coagulable, right? So this localized inflammatory response from the cancer was causing a systemic hypercoagulability. So we understand, if we can understand this basic mechanism of inflammation, then we can start to extrapolate and say, oh, I see how that affects other phenomenon. And another patient who was getting recurrent pulmonary emboli. Why are you getting this? It turns out he had ulcerative colitis. It was making him hypercoagulable for no other reason. He didn't have factor V light and he didn't have any kind of other hypercoagulable states. It's just the inflammation that was making him clot. So this is a picture of what I'm talking about. In the lower left corner, you see an area where the tissue's been damaged and you have all these bacteria the bacteria interact with the local cells and release certain chemicals that diffuse up into the capillary at the top. And that tells the endothelial cells to start expressing little molecules that actually capture the neutrophils. Do you see those, that little red thing that's hanging up? So the, the endothelial cells, they wake up, they get activated, and they start grabbing at neutrophils. So the neutrophils will get caught by these little butterfly nets, and then they start rolling along, and eventually they'll find an opening between the walls of the endothelia and will move through a process called diapodesis down into the area where the bacteria are located. Now, I think of this as a lot like what happens if you're having a picnic. It's a nice lovely sunny day and you, you pull out the chicken and you pull out the bread and you put it on your picnic table and suddenly there are all these wasps. How did they know? There were no wasps there when you sat down. You looked around, you didn't see any. Suddenly there's wasps and there's bees. How did they know? Well, they can pick up those chemical signals for, from kilometers away. 
They can pick up the small amounts of molecules that are present in the air and then it attracts them. And it's the same thing that's happening here. It's the smell. So the damaged tissue releases these chemicals, which are basically odors. And then receptors on these other cells will activate. The cells will be, begin to migrate down. And then you can see them engaging in phagocytosis. Once this gets set into motion, then our immune cells release free radicals through a process called the oxidative burst. It's basically bleach. So the infidels are at the, the walls of the castle and they're throwing up the ladders and they're trying to climb up to the top and then you've, you've got the soldiers at the top of the wall and they've got the boiling oil and they're pouring the boiling oil, the hot bleach, onto the infidels to keep them away. That's the same thing our immune cells do. They spray them with bleach, hydrogen peroxide and hypochlorite. They also start releasing these little bullets called cytokines, except the bullets have information in them that communicate to other cells to do something, to proliferate or to make more cytokines. So free radicals, cytokines, and then the liver starts responding to all this by releasing certain proteins like C-reactive protein or serum amyloid A. These are called acute phase reactants. So all of these things are kicking into place. The reason we release these free radicals is because they are nonspecific toxic repellents. And there's two main enzymes that produce these free radicals, NADPH oxidase, which is found in mitochondria, and myeloperoxidase, which is found in neutrophils and other cells. Now, this may seem a little esoteric. Why even bring it up? Because we can actually measure myeloperoxidase. It's now a commercial laboratory test. And if you suspect that a person has chronic inflammation, especially endothelial inflammation, you can actually measure MPO. And it's actually become a fairly routine test for me. Sometimes everything else that I measure in, in a patient that's at risk for cardiovascular disease is fine, but their MPO is up, and that tells me there's some kind of inflammatory trigger at work. Delighted to be here with Dr. Bob Roundtree, one of my favorite speakers on the whole functional medicine circuit. Bob, how are you doing? I'm great. Yeah, it's great to have you here in London for AFMCP. Yeah. And what was, you know, what was, what was so great about the lecture that I saw you give today, uh, Bob, is in fact it's a, a lecture that I saw myself that inspired me maybe six or seven years ago when, in Minneapolis when you gave that lecture. Um, it was incredible to, you brought up a lot of concepts that doctors are familiar with already. Yes, yes, yes. Compliments, inflammation, macrophages, histamine, these yes. sort of terms. Yes. But then you made it real for the, for the newer conditions, for the, for the common conditions that they're seeing. You really beautifully weaved in science yes. with the clinical narrative that these, that, these, that these guys are seeing in their clinic. And I thought that was really, really great. Well, thank you. I think what's really outstanding about functional medicine is that everything we do is evidence-based. Everything we do has got very strong science behind it, you know. Yeah. So it, this is not alternative medicine. No, I absolutely all. agree. I mean, yeah, we might use some herbs, or we might recommend acupuncture, we might recommend some alternative modalities, but really what we're going at are the mechanisms of disease. What is the molecular biology underneath a condition like rheumatoid arthritis? What is going on on a molecular level? How are immune cells working, you know, in, a, in an aberrant fashion? to cause this condition. So, you know, I'm very, very interested in all the different pathways involved. I have to say, one way that I've learned these pathways is by studying pharmacology, right? right? So a new drug comes out, a tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitor, and I say, okay, how does that work? Oh, it inhibits a cytokine. What's a cytokine? And then you start reverse engineering and working your way back and going, well, why are cytokines important? And then you begin to realize, oh, these are, Proteins that are being made by immune cells, well, why are they making them? So you keep asking why, why, why. It's an annoying question, I think, in modern medicine, because they want you to say, here, you've got this condition, take the drug. And I say, well, why are you using that drug in this condition? Why now? But I want to reverse engineer it. I want to work all the way back upstream to say, well, why is the cell making the cytokine in the first place? And is there anything you can do to keep that from happening? Well, you say, is it annoying to keep asking why? And I, I would <laughs> Very flip, annoying question. Well, I would flip around. I think the, the energy 
One of the reasons I think that AFMCP is so impactful, for me, the most impactful five days of my career since I qualified as a doctor, no question, because it's nice to know the mechanisms. It's yes. great to not just think of disease, protocol, it's great to think about actually what's going on here in the body yes. on a personal level. I find it fascinating and a lot of the doctors I've spoken to are re-engaged with that, you know, that, that sort of base level science that yes. they've forgotten about since medical yes, school. Yes, yes, Well, you go to medical school and then you learn this stuff, you learn it one time, you know, and you learn it so that you can figure out how to use the drugs appropriately. And yeah. then that's the end of the story. Uh, and then most docs, if they've been out of practice for, you know, 10 years away from medical school, you don't really have time to keep going in and looking at the mechanisms, right. but new mechanisms are being discovered all the time, yeah. right? So we're giving people an opportunity to dive back into the science and say, hey, this stuff is really important. It's fun, it makes medicine fun again. Uh, that's one of the things I got from this. There's something about really being here with other practitioners for a full immersion you know, to really diving deep into the waters, to not just dipping your toe in the water, but to actually taking a deep dive and being totally involved in this for a five day period of time. And understanding that, you know, this is not just one topic we're talking about. We're not just talking about autoimmune disease. We're not just talking about bowel disorders. We're not just talking about thyroid conditions. We're saying you can take any health condition you can name, any chronic disease you can name, and we can look at it from an entirely different lens. And when you begin to realize, well, wait a minute, this is, has so many applications yeah. that you become uh, what I call generative. Generative means that if you understand the mechanism behind a certain disease, you can say, well, the mechanism behind cardiovascular disease is really similar to the mechanism behind, say, cancer, or the mechanism behind a mood disorder. So you can, you can become generative instead of having to look in a book and saying, you know, what's the drug for depression and how do I treat the depression? Instead, you say, wait a minute, this is a, an inflammatory imbalance. And I can address that issue in a similar way to how I address cardiovascular disease. Yeah. And, and I think what doctors find is that when they start to address the underlying mechanism, let's say inflammation, not only does the symptom that they were wanting to treat get better, yes, yes, yes. but some seemingly other unrelated symptoms yes. also get better at the yeah. same time. Which we call it side benefits. Side, Instead side of side benefits. effects, you have side benefits. <laughs> Absolutely. You, should, you want to be applying these principles the next time you're in clinic, yep. start using this. Because, start using it now. Because the, the great thing about this approach, and one of the things that resonated with me so much when I first did my FMCP was that you know, we're not doing any harm. Right, you right. Know, what we're recommending to right. our patients, worst right. case scenario, yeah. right, is they're not getting better. Right. Right, but we're not really doing any harm. Right. And, and I love that, that really spoke to me as a doctor. One thing I, I wanted to make very clear in my lecture this morning is that, again, this is not alternative medicine, so I'm not telling a person with rheumatoid arthritis, stop your drugs, no. you know, throw away your clutches. Yeah. Right, you don't need any, I don't say that at all. Yeah. I'm very, very clear to say, no, you keep doing what you're doing, Right? But you add on all these other things. You make the dietary changes, you take the gluten out, you add probiotics, uh, you either eat more deep sea fish or you take fish oil capsules yeah. or probiotics. So it's all in addition to. So it's a much richer kind of intervention. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you. My great pleasure. My clinical tip is breathing, which sounds really banal, but honestly, it makes a massive difference. Um, they're really keen for us as doctors to also be very aware of that, that we kind of connect with this neurobiological cave and reset ourselves between each patient. And a really simple way to do that, and it sounds a bit yogi and a bit bohemian, but it's all to do with kind of the vagal system and parasympathetic, so it's entrenched in a lot of evidence. And it's so simple and it's so beautiful. So breathe. I'm Pippa Campbell and I'm a nutrition and weight loss coach. My clinical tip is to eat two cups of green leafy veg a day, like arugula, stroke rocket, watercress. They're rich in vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients. Hello, my name's Christine Bailey. I'm a functional nutritional practitioner. I work in Berkshire and Harley Street. My one clinical tip to give to a client is start with just one change a day and start with breakfast. If you can start your day feeling that you have done something proactive to nourish your body, 
it will help you with the confidence they need to carry on making changes. All you need is one change to make a big impact on your health. Next up, we've got the inspirational Michael Ash. He's an MD and a registered nutritional therapist. He's going to be talking about food allergies, sensitivities and intolerances. One of the questions that we need to be thinking could be a contributor to the reason why this person can no longer tolerate a food. How many of you have discovered that as you've aged or have had an experience where you've been unwell or on some medication, but you have no longer able to eat foods that you previously used to eat with gusto when you were younger. Quite a lot. So post-infectious IBS, post-infectious loss of tolerance, some form of event can take place for which you do not fully recover. The change in the ecology of your gut leads to an alteration in your ability to recognize a food as a friend, instead of which it or components of it become your enemy. A key component of this is down to your intestinal permeability, which I'll cover in a bit more detail as we go along. The exposure to medications, and obviously you've learned a great deal about inappropriate use of antibiotics and consistent or long-term use of antibiotics and its effect on the ability to maintain appropriate diversity or redundancy inside the bacteria in your gut. Now, redundancy is a concept that has been around since Wadham in 1930 started talking about nutrigenomics. An English scientist wrote about the effect of the environment on gene transcription over 80 years ago. And what he talked about was redundancy. And the point is that if you have a very wide range of organisms, which you've been gifted by your mother primarily, that you've environmentally ingested and geographically settled, they have the capacity to swap responsibility dependent upon their diversity. So if one group becomes knocked out by virtue of a toxic exposure or a drug exposure or a lifestyle change, there are enough organisms left within that pool to compensate for their absence. That's what we call redundancy. Redundancy depends on the appropriate ability to maintain a large range of diversity. And what we can see in studies taken between tribes in the Hadza and populations of Italians is that the diversity between traditional hunter-gatherers and more conventionalized Western consumers has been declining over the last 60 to 80 years. Which is one of the reasons why environmental consequences contributing towards the risk or the development of food allergies and food sensitivities is increasingly concentrating on the fact that the biggest gene pool, the biggest transcription mechanism we have in our body is found within the bacteria inside our gastrointestinal tract. Our own genes are outnumbered by roughly 200 to 1. As a result, if they receive food in a form that isn't easy for them to metabolize, their contribution to immune tolerance declines. And one of the key things for this is the absence of appropriate hydrochloric acid, as well as a deficiency or an absence of nutrients necessary either to make hydrochloric acid or to maintain barrier integrity, as well as inherited genetic or epigenetic bias. And we can include in this area stress or an inappropriate response to a typical stressor that leads to the production or excess production of adrenaline and cortisol, both of which will materially change the way that your bacteria in your gastrointestinal tract both relate to each other and to your immune system, often just for a transitional period. But we see many people who are under chronic, irresolvable stress for which GI symptoms are a natural manifestation of their difficulty in controlling their life. I'm pleased now to be speaking to Michael Ash. Michael is one of the speakers here, but he's also part of IFM's international faculty. And he's also the founder of Clinical Education, who has been bringing functional medicine training to the UK for a number of years. Michael, how is it going today? Fantastically. Yeah. I have to say we've been really impressed this year. Um, we've had the greatest number of attendees uh, in the, it's our fifth event that we've done. So every time we've increased the number of people that come, 
But what's particularly exciting for me is that we've increased the number of medical doctors that fall into the training enthusiasm that we used to see with nutritional therapists and other types of healthcare professionals. Uh, but the growth in the GP numbers has been a great, great boost. I mean, that's been really striking for me, uh, Mike, since, you know, since coming to the course this time, since you know, I've been talking to the attendees, and there is such a lot of medical doctors here. You know, I think it's around 150 or so, which that's is, right. well, I think it's a five-fold increase from just three years ago. Yeah. I mean, that's huge, a huge growth in interest. Why do you think that is? I think it's two, or maybe three things. I think first of all, there's been a lot more exposure, you know, through the Doctor in the House program, through your book, there's been a lot more understanding that you can really change things in people that are stuck in pretty unpleasant chronic conditions quickly if you know what to do. And then there's this sense of, well, what do I do and how do I learn about that? And I think we both of us know that that's a, a big gap that needs to be filled. And there's a sense that this is very safe therapy. You yeah. can run it alongside the standard care. It's a little difficult to compress it when you first learn it but it doesn't put anybody in a difficult professional position. It just gives them another tool to their already extensive toolbox and it allows them to cultivate a change in culture in the patients that they're seeing and get them well again. Yeah, it's incredible to see that the, the breadth of people who are here because if we, we talk about all the different professions, yes, we've got nutritional therapists, there are some acupuncturists, I think, yeah, some osteopaths, chiropractors. chiropractors, medical doctors here, but not just GPs. There's also um, an anaesthetist I was talking to yesterday yes. who was telling me that a lot of his patients with energy problems that he sees, he doesn't feel he's got the right tools to help them. And so it, it, it's fascinating for me, having been invested in this model for a number of years now, to see the wide breadth of people who are here. You, we've seen that in the course. Are you seeing that in terms of inquiries that clinical education are getting as well? well I think you, you hit it really well. We have the primary care physicians and we have the people who are in private practice who have their own sort of little primary care world um, but don't often tie up or connect. And we have the secondary care for physicians, the consultants, the people who are often quite specialist. Yeah. Really, I think they've got to open up their, their lens to look a bit wider again. And so we have. We had over a thousand people inquire about attending this course. Uh, th over 300 converted, but of that thousand, we had many, many doctors uh, and secondary care physicians who are just beginning to feel their way. They wanted some information about it, they're just getting to learn about it. And as we discover, each time a cohort attends and leads, whichever profession you're with, they spread the message. They're enthusiastic, they're excited, and therefore the, in the interest grows. There's a belief out there that you can only do this in private practice if you've got an hour, an hour and a half with your patients. But I'm very keen, as you are, to sort of demonstrate that that is not necessarily the case. I actually believe that some of these aspects can be delivered in an NHS 10-minute consultation if you're working in collaboration with other team members. And I think that's something that um, you know, you're really trying to promote here is collaboration with different healthcare professionals. How important do you think that collaboration is? If you're on your own in whatever professional group it is and you're trying to plow your own path, it's exhausting. Yeah. Having peers around you initially that share your enthusiasm gives you the confidence to get engaged and also to be able to respond to often what a, let's just say, unqualified opinion about what someone is or isn't doing. And then the next thing is try to find other people who share that views, but not necessarily your same primary qualification, but fill a gap. And so it's very important for us that the nutritional therapists and the structural therapists align themselves with primary care therapists who don't have that same level of expertise, but can deliver a high level of, of comfort to the additional practitioner and vice versa. And that energy that comes from those two or three people working together, transfers through the patient who becomes the fourth or third member of that team is dramatic. So my, earlier in the year, we put on a one-day event prescribing lifestyle medicine to really try and showcase, particularly to medical professionals, how a systems approach, and looking at the body as, a, you know, as, as being interconnected, um, and then how we can apply some quite simple but targeted lifestyle interventions can have profound impacts very, very quickly. It's amazing to me how many of those PLM attendees are actually here today. Sure. Well, I think there were two things that really stood out for, for you and me and, and also Oyen who, who worked with us on this, uh, is that a masterclass, i.e. trying to compress high level knowledge into uh, easily understandable chunks that can be converted into a 10 minute appointment, is a very skillful task. It takes a lot of time, it took us, what, nearly a year to work out how to do that. Yeah. Uh, and the plus of it is, is that we suddenly took a group of very interested clinicians 
who felt too distant from that time zone that you're referring to because they can't chop up their day anymore yeah. into taking bite-sized chunks of very important bits of information to be able to deliver it direct to their patient and build that relationship with them. And I think it's a natural extension of that excitement of seeing what happens with that little bit of information that they want to come to a course like this and gain a bit more and then onwards from there and gain more again. Yeah, because they get a little taster, don't they? And they want to know, well, what's more? You know, I think you introduced them to the microbiome and the immune system and how powerful that is in the genesis of so many of the different conditions that and, and complaints and symptoms that healthcare professionals are seeing. And I think for those who are really interested, they want more. Absolutely. You know, I know what I was like when I did AFMCP, I've said many times before, this was the most impactful course that I have done uh, since I qualified as a doctor. And you know, it's, it's, it must be incredibly, it's exciting for me, it must be for you as well to see you know, a room full of so many people enthused, looking to learn what you've been trying to sort of bring here for a long time now. How long have you been teaching functional medicine for? Well, over 20 years. Uh, yeah. So over 20 years in the UK, and uh, yeah, it, it felt quite lonely when, you, when, when we began. Um, yeah. and I know we've worked together for a long time, but yes, I just come off the stage and uh, looking at the faces of people paying attention and really sort of trying to take the key points away from that. So they got something that locks in and they can carry that information on and apply it. I think the key, key thing I'm noticing with um, a lot of the medical professionals I spoke to yesterday evening is this real light bulb moment that everything that's been recommended here is harmless. Yeah. Um, it's quite intuitive, it makes sense, and it's really focused on creating health rather than labeling a symptom or treating a symptom or you know, looking at illness. This is on, you know, in so many aspects, is, is how do we create health? Mm -hmm. And I think that is quite an inspiring message uh, for a lot of these the professionals who are here. We know in the UK there's a great deal of disharmony in the general practice world. Yeah. They're unhappy, they feel disconnected at times, and often they've lost the love for what they do. And on the other side of the room, or the other side of the party, we hear people here are absolutely passionate, but have no way of being able to make that connection with the primary care team. And so there's two people who don't even know that they're looking for each other most of the time, and then are discovering themselves. And within that, they find the language that we teach, a language and a methodology that makes sense to both parties. And that's a real skill at the end of the day, so that everyone can leave here able to talk to each other using terminology and understandings that both parties recognize. Yeah. And that's been a difficult issue for, for many years, finding a common platform that everybody can work off. Well, I just want to say thank you for all your hard work at bringing functional medicine and this style of medicine here over to the UK. It's incredibly gratifying for me to see so many people here. It must be for you too. Thanks so much. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Hello, my name is Anthony Haynes. I'm a nutritional therapist. I've been in practice for over 25 years. The clinical ticket that I have is been something that's benefited thousands of my patients, and I've seen about 20,000 patients. And that is a very simple thing to do each morning. Protein intake stabilizes blood sugar, stabilizes mood, helps appetite, helps fat metabolism. And for this reason, I recommend the vast majority of patients that I see based on their case history to eat a high biological value protein at breakfast every day. This means eating an animal protein or a protein smoothie if you're a vegetarian or protein powder to ensure you have 25 grams of protein at breakfast every day. Hi, I'm Ashby, a medical doctor, a personal trainer and a nutritionist. I've been practicing functional medicine for five to six years now and have had great results. My main pearl of wisdom is keep it simple. There is so much conflicting evidence nowadays with different diets and different lifestyles. People just do not know what to eat or who to believe. So I have a very, very simple generic philosophy that I apply to every single patient I see, and that is make every meal full of vegetables, if you can. They're basically the one food group that I think most people cannot argue with in having benefits, full of phytochemicals and cancer preventing compounds that really will benefit our health. So if you can just do one thing from today onwards, make every meal, have half a plate of vegetables, a rainbow preferably, you'll be winning. So Gemma, why is it that you signed up to come and do the AFMCP course? Well, I just really felt that I wanted to use some fantastic new tools to help my patients. Um, I felt instinctively that I could help them in so many ways, and I was starting to do so in my practice, but 
it's just quite limited in its scope. Whereas I knew that if I came on this course, I'd learn some very specific tools that would allow me to get to the root cause of illness, which is what I was really looking for. And we're two days into a five day course, how have you found it so far? It's been absolutely fantastic, it really has. I've been learning all sorts of fantastic um, strategies for implementing these changes for my patients, learning about their story, listening to them, understanding where their problems could have come from. So it's been hugely empowering for me and obviously I hope for my patients as well. Has the course so far sort of delivered more than what you were expecting? So far it's been a masterclass in biochemistry, it's been a masterclass in empathy, it's been a masterclass in putting everything together, so it's been far more than I expected. As doctors it's amazing that we kind of know that we should be good at those things, but yes. somewhere along the line we stop I know. practicing that way and we forget the biochemistry and we've you know, yes, intuitively, a lot of us have got empathy, but we even forget that sometimes, and it's kind of nice to be reminded. It was fantastic to be reminded, and that's what I've actually loved most about the course, is it brings you right back to what we all have in common and, and where we all struggle, and that's what, that's what a lot of people go into medicine for, is to heal and to help, um, and that often comes from a personal yearning to help other people, and you lose that, I think, if you feel stressed or if you yourself feel you're not getting the results that you want, and this has really brought me back to you know, the things that I went into medicine for. Next up, we've got Dr. Shilpa Satsini. She's a medical doctor from Florida, and she's talking about the ABCDs of nutritional evaluation. We're going to be talking functional nutrition. So just to be able to clarify, functional medicine is the larger umbrella. Functional nutrition is an aspect of the larger functional medicine paradigm. And the goal of functional nutrition is to emphasize high quality foods and phytonutrient diversity, fancy words for eat good and eat the rainbow, and to not only eat that type of food or quality of food, but then to personalize it with distributions of what type of macronutrient they should be on. Is it something that should help promote and heal neurocognitive uh, well-being or is it really more for cardiometabolic? So it's not going to be that eat right and exercise one size fits all prescription that we're leaning towards. So again, we have our own little subdivision of gather, organize, and initiate within functional nutrition. So remember that in the gather phase, you will get information about food and nutrition through the timeline. You would also get it through the MSQ potentially, like um, what is their GI system showing or manifesting? There are also diet and lifestyle journals that are handouts that you can give to your patient who will then proceed to tell you very quickly, you'll see these in your folder, oh, I eat a lot of green, but I don't eat a lot of purple or red because the way they input the information, it kind of becomes evident to you and them what would be an easy jumping point. So once you have gathered that information, then just like in GoToIt, you're going to initiate a food and nutrition prescription. I just wanna make sure you understand the overview of what we're trying to accomplish. Again, it's just like in functional medicine, but we're specifying nutrition as our focus. We're gonna take a medical history with, a, with, with this lens of I need to figure out how does this person feed themselves? How do they assimilate food? And then do some physical exam uh, and lab data retrieval, and then put it all together to then initiate one of three entry-level food plans, okay? So when I say entry-level, we have additional food prescriptions in the functional medicine paradigm. During this base course of five days, we're going to introduce you to these three. You've learned about one, the elimination diet, and it's probably a good time to mention when we use the word diet, it means it's short term. So you're not meant to be on an elimination diet as a lifelong strategy. You might be on an oligoantigenic food plan, meaning after you finish the diet and you've determined that soy and dairy are your triggers, 
Well, then you bring, you've brought back in the other eliminated foods, and now what you do is moving forward, you might have an oligoantigenic, meaning you're taking the soy and the dairy out, cardiometabolic food plan. And you might pick cardiometabolic based on the history and the physical exam and the timeline and the matrix. So main point, the word diet is a short-term food prescription, whereas if you see the core food plan and the cardiometabolic food plan is meant to be sustainable. They're templates, they're semi-standardized. So, you know, we have a core food plan, but it might be personalized to be vegan for someone, or a cardiometabolic food plan that is personalized to remove soy and cheese, or soy and dairy, excuse me. Do you understand the difference between the, the way we, as an institution, use the word diet and food plan? Okay, perfect. So that's the goal, is to be able to personalize the food prescription. So these are our objectives, but the main objective for you when you are face-to-face -face with your patient is what is the goal for your patient? Not what do you want to feed the patient, what you want to force them to eat at home, which is what I did to my mom and dad. <clears throat> when I was done with the IFM, first AFMCP, I was getting it, but I apparently didn't get it enough. Because I go home and I tell my Indian parents, you need to follow the Mediterranean food plan. <laughs> and my mom looked at me like, well, well where does the rotli fit in? And where do my vegetables fit in? And how many legumes? And I don't want to eat meat. And so where do you want me to get my protein? And well, this is the most studied diet. So we're going to pretend that you're more Mediterranean. Can we bring pasta into the... And she, she was confused. And that's when I realized you can't impose science onto a person. You have to kind of bring it into their life in a way that makes sense for them. And so I had to learn how to create a cardiometabolic vegetarian Indian food plan. Does that make sense? You'll have to do that with all of your patients based on their food story. You know, it might be culturally flavored. It might also be related to, like, do not take my red meat away. In some parts of, you know, Florida and in uh, the, the U.S., if you take their red meat away, it's it's like you're taking away a child. So you have to understand to meet them where they are. I'm now here with Dr. Shilpa Saxena, MD from the United States, but also I think one of the most popular and most loved presenters on the functional medicine circuit. Shilpa, how's it going so far? Wonderful as always. It's always good to be a part of this energy. Yeah, it's great to have you all here in London for you know, what's the biggest AFMCP event that we've Exciting. ever had here? We've got more medical doctors than we've ever had before. Can you feel the difference this time from last time you were here in the UK? I love being in the UK, first of all. <laughs> this is my third time being here. And the difference is probably more palpable to the people of UK and Europe knowing that this is a movement that requires more traction. Yeah. I can feel the difference always because whenever anybody is really understanding how they can more powerfully help people, there's a different energy and a buzz in the room, and that happens whether it's nutritional uh, professionals or physicians. But it's just wonderful as a movement to have more of these decision makers, if you will, the medical doctors, be a part of the movement now. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find uh, when you're lecturing all over the world, do you feel you have to deliver the message differently depending on which country you're in? Absolutely, uh, because it depends on how open they are. In fact, we have this discussion that when we speak to people who come from a culture who embrace more of this natural or um, let's say more plant-based, non-pharmaceutical approach to health and healing, those allopathic physicians embrace this science quicker because they might say, oh, my grandmother used to do this type yeah. of thing. Uh, whereas if you come to a culture that may not have those same roots, then it requires a little bit more convincing in the language that they're familiar with. So it does change based on the country. In Peru, we were speaking science that made complete sense to them. They, they were just saying, oh good, this is the language that proves what we've always known. Yeah. Yeah. India would probably be very similar. And that's not to say that the UK is not one of those countries, but it may not have an indigenous culture that, you know, really use plant materials the way maybe the Peruvians and the Quechua people did. 
Yeah, that's a great point actually. Um, I know certainly as you do when we talk to patients, we have to alter the way we deliver information depending on who that patient is in front of us. And I guess teaching healthcare professionals, it's no different really. Right. And you know, there's a big difference between speaking and teaching. And this is the point that you're bringing on is, is that speaking is unidirectional. It's just like you're trying to unload some content but teaching is really an act of service where you really need to find the patient or the provider where they're at and now deliver a message that moves them, inspires them to act. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the reasons you are a very popular presenter is because I think people really connect with you. They connect with your stories, with your energy, the way you deliver that information. And um, it's something I certainly have been on the receiving end when I've seen you speak before. Um, I'm interested, do you remember your very first AFMCP? Oh, absolutely. February 2008, Pasadena, California. I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to be doing this course because a lot of my patients take these things called supplements. And I thought, I should understand this to protect them. <laughs> you know, no, I mean, I was definitely curious and I thought that there was some legitimacy to it. But really, I was doing this allopathic inquiry. And as I was going through the process, day one, it was in California, which was a different time zone um, from where I lived, I would call back to my hometown, to my husband, I'm like, you're not gonna believe this. And I remember those moments, like the low acid talk and Tom Salt, and just also being surrounded by people who were human and not mm, personas, yeah. if that makes sense. And it was just so refreshing in healthcare in academic medicine to be around real physicians who were talking about real solutions. Yeah, absolutely. I remember my first AFMCP really well. And the story that resonated with me was, said you kept calling your husband to tell him, you'll never believe this. That's exactly what I did. I was in Minneapolis. Um, I remember it well. A lot of the speakers here today yes. in our, thing, our, our events in London were the same speakers who I got inspired by all those years ago. So that's you know just fantastic for me. Um, but I remember calling my wife every night thinking, this is just amazing. This is blowing my mind. Oh, did you know this? Oh, yes. And then they started fearing. I mean, they almost fear whenever I come back from a conference because <coughs> I have some of this information that's going to now change the way we live. And it's, they're very grateful for it in the long term. In the short term, they're probably a little nervous, just like patients probably are when they learn this type of information. Like, to, yeah. sometimes we get nervous with the amount of power that we actually have. You know, something I, I think about, um, as we get more and more experience as clinicians, you know, we can often assume that everyone else knows what we know. Yes. And what I mean by that is when you're speaking to, you know, a room of 300 healthcare professionals, lots of them, not all of them, but lots of them are coming in fresh to this way of thinking. This is a brand new way of thinking, a new framework to look at patient care through. Do you have to always remind yourself you know, not to assume knowledge. You have to remind yourself that, yeah, you know what? A lot of these guys don't know what I know at the moment, and mm -hmm. I just need to, uh, you, you see what I'm getting at? Is yes, the way that I look at it is, is I think many of the providers here intuitively know what we're speaking about, but it's the granular knowledge and evidence that they need to put language and protocol and processes behind it. I mean, if I tell someone, did you know that food is important for your health? And I, I wasn't the person who gave them this compelling news. <laughs> they kind of knew that some of the things we talk about over and over are truth, whether they've read it in a journal or not. But what is refreshing for them and for me is to create the language and the framework, the science-based framework for them to now take that intuition process it in a way that now they're able to deliver it to patients with confidence. Yeah, and that, that really resonates with me because that's exactly what AFMCP did for me the mm -hmm. very first time I did it. It's you, I think the people who come here anyway all are looking for that validation. They, yes. all, they sort of know that there's something else that they could be doing for their patients. Right. And the evidence presented, the mechanisms, the pathways, it makes certainly us as medical doctors, it makes us feel good that, oh yes, there is some validity here. Right, and I think it's because we have a trained skepticism. Yeah. I, you know, if you look at a child, if I teach a child functional medicine, some of the basic principles, and I relate it to how a plant grows, they okay. get it just like that. And that's because I don't think they have that trained skepticism. They still have that wonder about them. 
And I think that we need to bring that back, that wonder and humility about how the body works and how we are actually not the drivers of the healing. The body is doing the work. If we could have that humility to know, we just have to give the body what it needs, take out the things that it doesn't need. And a lot of times the body does the, the heavy lifting, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's very um, liberating, I think, as a physician myself to not have to own that responsibility completely. Have you had the chance yet to speak to many of the attendees here and you know if so what have you been hearing you know are people excited are they feeling inspired you know are they, are they oh. getting scared? I think it's all of that but okay. I think most of it is positive positive. and I think the scared is not a negative scared it's just like oh my goodness now I know this yeah. and just like you mentioned when you know this it's hard to act like you don't. You can't sit through five days of AFMCP and then say, I don't know if there's evidence to this whole lifestyle functional medicine thing. Because we, we just hammer people with references and biochemistry and pathophysiology that you really can't leave thinking, I'm not sure. So then I think the next step that are, these people who are inspired and ready to go are wondering is, is well, now what? Now, how am I going to go back out into the world yeah. and start making this a real phenomenon for my patients and myself? And once you know it, you can't go back. You cannot. That's, and, and it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And I think that that's an inspired divine process myself. I think that we, of course, end up exactly where we need to be. And then it's a bit of fate that brought us there and a little bit of free will that's going to determine what are we going to do with this gift that we've just been given. So this is where I think we as faculty need to help them as well. We are not just the deliverers of the science, we have to be the deliverers of inspiration and implementation. Because in the end, if the knowledge just gets stuck in this ballroom, that was yeah. a lot of money and time wasted. Yeah. So if we, if we really understand the full picture, we have to understand we must inspire, teach, and then help implement. All right, so if you've been watching this course and you live anywhere else in the world apart from England, then there's a good chance that you have a good choice to be able to do this in private medicine. All around the world now, you're seeing doctors starting to build integrative and functional medicine practices. We've had doctors on this show from Egypt, from Estonia, from Brazil, from Mexico. Like, this is happening, we've been to Australia, this is happening everywhere. Now, if you're gonna build a private practice doing functional integrative medicine, you have to realize that the practice of this kind of medicine requires a totally different operating system in the clinic itself. You need to activate the patient to be part of the care. And so that's why we created the Practice Accelerator. If you go to goevomed.com slash brochure, you can find out more about it. We have created the most innovative physician community on the planet where physicians who are interested in the new era of medicine are coming together, learning how to do things like group visits, technology, all kinds of different things that are needed to actually activate a new era in medicine. So if you want to be part of the Practice Accelerator, go to goevomed.com slash brochure, download the brochure, get in touch with us. Everywhere in the world this is happening right now and we are creating a community of physicians who can transform the medicine in whatever country you come from. Come join us, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Thank you for joining me today for the UK Functional Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Wangan Chatterjee. Hope you enjoy the show and we will see you next time.